Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Futurati Podcast. Today, we're interviewing Dr. Roman V. Impolsky, who is a tenured associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Louisville. He is the founding and current director of the Cybersecurity Lab and an author of many books, the most recent of which is Artificial Superintelligence, A Futuristic Approach. Dr. Yampolsky, thanks for being with us. Thanks for inviting me. So here's the first question I want to ask you, and it's a question we ask all of our guests, and I'd like a simple yes or no. Are you or are you not Satoshi Nakamoto? Yes. You are. I knew it. <laughs> Mystery solved. Can I have some Bitcoin? <laughs> so the question was yes or no. <laughs> Follow-up question. Can I have some Bitcoin? Uh, no. Probably. Yeah. Why don't you give us a little background about yourself, your interests, and what brought you to working on the problems you're working on today? So I'm a computer scientist. I work on artificial intelligence, specifically the subdomain of safety and security which is kind of like a combination of machine learning and cybersecurity. How do we make machines not just very capable, but also safe uh, for users and secure against uh, any threats, hackers, anyone trying to modify how the system works. I started in behavioral biometrics, got my PhD in um, trying to recognize poker players based on their strategy. And I quickly realized that more and more of poker players are actually bots. So a lot of techniques we use to prevent human attackers also work for bots. But uh, what happens when bots get smarter and smarter? That's AI safety. Here I am. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Could you just briefly talk a little bit about the behavioral biometrics piece? Because I I read that, but my mind kind of went over it and I assumed it was fingerprinting or something. I I didn't realize it's like mind printing. You're trying to recognize. Right. So physical biometrics are fingerprints. That's what people usually think of face recognition. But you can also profile people based on how they walk, how they talk, how they eat, any interaction with a computer, keyboard dynamics, mouse dynamics. Uh, I was looking at more abstract uh, more cognitive biometrics, so game strategy, how you play a game, your style of play specifically for poker, is also something we can use to verify your identity. It's not as accurate as physical biometrics. You cannot authenticate someone out of 8 billion people using it, but I can tell if someone stole your account and is playing very differently. Oh, very interesting. So what what do the models look like for trying to capture the dynamics of a person's strategy? What What sorts of models do you use? So if you play poker, you know, there are different uh, decision-making points, pre-flop, post-flop, and you can kind of do statistical analysis on frequencies you typically play, a uh, range of cards you typically decide to go with, uh, bluffing strategies, things of that nature. Very interesting. So with with the poker world um, in, in the whole gambling industry, since there really are no true games of chance out there, does does the industry survive, or how does it have to modify itself so that um, it doesn't get taken over by AI? So for online play, I think it's going to be just like chess. You cannot get uh, chess play for money online. In real life, where I see you, we can still be humans competing. I think it's still going to be quite attractive. But, uh, yeah, I think already for... Uh, Two-player version, heads up, I think computers are completely dominating and more and more for full game with 10 players, so I wouldn't play it online. Then I graduated with my PhD, I kind of had a lot of interest in playing poker and I was considering doing it professionally, but I think I made the right decision of uh, not uh, (laughs) ending up as online poker player. Well, that's good. I mean, now you're the one building the system. So arguably there might be even more profit in that in the long run, as long as you can convince can't comment again, the same <laughs> as Satoshi thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do, do you have any idea how the algorithms today that are playing poker with multiple players, do you, do you know what sorts of psychological models they use for the other players? Like how do they model a human being? I've, I've always just been kind of curious about that. 
So that's not the only way to, to play poker. So you can do modeling and you can keep track. If you have access to their public profile, you have a huge advantage. Before you ever sit down to play with them, you know exactly what percentages they play and how. But you can also try and uh, approximate Nash equilibrium for different games. And that's basically you playing perfect games. So if a human makes a mistake, you're winning. So you don't need to really know this specific player. That's that's extra points. But just playing perfect in given situation, they have to adapt to me, and they likely to make mistakes. I got you. So the, the reason I keep asking this is because we have a strong interest in using artificial intelligence for more benign ends like education. And I'm always sort of curious as to how you build a model of a student or identify a weakness such that you would want to correct it or bring a human teacher's attention to it. So I didn't know what the uh, word that's like. a great question. And uh, for education, uh, you can look at the uh, preference in terms of learning styles, speed of learning. Uh, there is a lot of kind of adaptation you can do. Absolutely. OK, so the meat of your work is on AI safety, and I, I want to get into that and spend as much time on it as you want to 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 move in that direction. Given that Andrew Ng has, has compared worrying about out of control algorithms to worrying about overpopulation on Mars, could you just sort of briefly adumbrate the case for caring about this field and studying it today? Well, I think you also said that AI is the new electricity or something like that. And my goal is not to get you electrocuted. Right. I think this is what we're trying to do. So I have a paper where we look at uh, historical examples of AI accidents. From very early days, uh, AI failed. So you designed it to do X, it failed to X, depending on how involved the system is, what it controls, damage could be trivial. It's a chatbot who said something incorrect. If it's uh, controlling stock market, now it crashed the market, you lost a couple billion dollars. And as they get more uh, popular, more people are using AI systems, they control more of our cyber infrastructure, the damage is getting progressively bigger and frequency of accidents increases. Uh, this uh, effort, I think it ended up being a database for uh, partnership on AI. And I think now it has something like 400 examples of uh, accidents, uh, problems, and keeps growing exponentially. So we can project this forward. What happens when you have a system controlling uh, your nuclear response? What happens when you have a system controlling really all aspects of our government? If it makes one mistake in a billion and it makes 10 billion decisions a minute, what happens? So I, I had been assuming that you were working on something like the control problem for a, an artificial superintelligence or a recursively self-improving alg algorithm, but it sounds like you're interested more in the broader space of just getting systems to behave well at all. Is that right? Well, you have to solve small, easy problems if you want to solve a bigger one. It's kind of a subset of it. If we can't control narrow AI today playing chess, how are you going to control superintelligence playing chess with the universe? Uh, the, the ultimate goal, of course, is complete control of intelligence, no matter how much it scales, no matter how it's designed. Yes. So you've said that our best bet is to use confinement measures against subhuman AI systems and to update them as, as needed with increasing capacities. Uh, your proposed mechanisms include boxing and air gapping. And I, I'm wondering why focus on confinement as opposed to trying to solve the alignment problem. Is it just because it's a lot easier? So I, I don't think it's a solution. I think it's a method, it's a tool for us to buy a little more time while we're testing the system, while we're designing other methods. So I, I think I conclude my paper by saying no, no amount of boxing is a permanent solution. It will never be sufficient. So it's kind of like I have a toolkit for studying a computer virus. Yes, it's air-gapped. Yes, I can see inputs and outputs, but I don't think it solves computer viruses as a problem. Now... There are many different proposals for what control actually looks like. Alignment is one, uh, one very popular proposal. The problem is, if you really think about what is being proposed, you quickly realize that cannot work. So first of all, the question is, who are you aligning with? There is 8 billion humans, and we don't agree on much. We couldn't solve ethics. We had millennia of research and morals and ethics, and we just came up with different uh, types. You have your religious ethics, utilitarian ethics, there's dozens of different variants, they don't agree, and each one has edge cases where we know it fails. If agent is uh, a human being, so limited power, they fail, I don't know, they become a serial killer or something, they kill 50 people, they get caught, we're done. Now, if you have a godlike system, 
the damage is proportionate. So you cannot have those uh, edge cases where, oh, okay, so it's a small fraction of all cases. Since, since we don't have perpetual motion machines, um, the idea of having a, um, an AI system that goes on indefinitely, that, um, uh, I mean, don't, don't all machines eventually die? And, um, and so, I mean, we can, we can certainly have uh, AI systems that repair themselves or um, uh, fix themselves. And so is, is I, I guess I'm getting to the question of how, how long a life can AI have proportional to humans and is, uh, do, uh, does, is there really a, a problem that they're not going to die anyway somewhere along the way? So I don't think software dies as long as you keep uh, running, you know, Internet is alive, Bitcoin is alive. There is not an expiration date for those things. They just keep kind of refreshing memory resources and compute. Uh, so I don't think we can just wait for them to die out if that's what you ask me. Yeah, there's um, I mean, if they if they take over everything, I mean, they do need to have supp power supplied to them. They need. Um, some sort of environment to be working on. Um, all the old computers that we've had in the past have eventually uh, gotten totally obsolete, and they they start losing their their integrity. They they start falling apart and degrading. Um, and so there's uh, there's an assumption here that that AI can be perpetually alive forever. Is is that a, a valid assumption. In, individual computers die all the time. Internet doesn't stop working because I disconnected my old laptop. You just switch to a new computer, whatever it is, a quantum computer, cloud, uh, doesn't matter. You keep uh, moving your algorithm to new hardware. Yeah, but that's a participative. Um, uh, there's, there's lots of people involved in keeping it alive. I mean, if all those people stop. Well, not really. Look about the computer viruses, right? Nobody's like actively sustaining them and you can't turn them off. Okay. Okay. I'll let me think about that some more. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So turning them off has been proposed. People considered it and there are problems with that approach. Well, let, let's talk about that. So I'm, I take kind of a strong interest in the control problem and the alignment problem and I've given some talks on it. So, let, I mean, let, let's feel free to get as far into the weeds as you want to. So what are the problems with turning it off? If it's smarter than you, it will predict that you will try that and be a few steps ahead of you. Maybe it will turn you off first. Sure. Or convince me to turn myself off. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, is, isn't that sort of a, a general reply or rebuttal to all the proposals for controlling the AIs. I mean, if they're smarter than us, presumably none of this will really work. So one of the things you, you favor is engineering Achilles heels into these systems. Uh, what's to stop it from, from predicting that that's a strategy we would employ and start looking around for those things? Well, I don't think there is an actual solution. I think the problem is unsolvable. So there are limits to all the proposals, just some of them buy more time. Some of them uh, allow us a little more control for less than fully super intelligent systems uh, it's kind of a trade-off the more resources you put in the more you can get out of it but i don't think there is a like a perfect solution it doesn't matter how smart it is how long it's going to work uh, you'll stay in charge i don't think it's a thing so then once it once it becomes in charge what happens then i mean i many of the ai safety researchers are looking for something that they would call a solution i mean the alignment problem which you are skeptical of uh, so if we're buying time, what are we buying time for? Existence. If you have cancer, I mean, why are you doing chemotherapy, right? You just want a little more time. You're not solving anything. You're like, hey, I'll get another year. So, so is your perspective that eventually the AIs will be in charge of everything and there's just really nothing we can do to stop that? As long as we keep developing them, I don't think there is uh, a way to permanently control a much smarter system. Alignment, even let's say we somehow solve the... Uh, disagreement between humans we all agree this is what we want even aligning with that uh what we want at this current level of intelligence and what we would want if we were smarter had more time to think about it would be completely different think about the difference between children and adults right so my kids they want to eat donuts and play video games i want them to eat carrots and exercise <laughs> if i'm in charge what they want is no longer 
taken into consideration to any degree. If they are in charge, then there is no advantage of my greater intelligence. A two-year-old is running a show. So you have to make this decision, who is in charge. And the moment we go, well, we want a smarter system to be in charge, by definition, we're not in control. It can decide to be very nice to us. It can decide to go, okay, you can eat donuts on Saturdays, but it can also decide something completely unreasonable, which we would not agree on. Uh, example I give in my paper is uh, uh, negative utilitarians think that if we didn't exist, there would be no suffering, so it's an advantage. Maybe a very smart philosopher, super intelligent philosopher would agree and find a way to solve that problem. So I, I think the standard reply to that is that what you're looking for is not a thing that we agree on. It's coherent, extrapolated volition. It's the thing that we'd want if we were smarter and better and we grew, I forget the phrase, further together or something. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's exactly what I'm referring to. So if you were smarter, the things you would want would not be things you want now. It's like if there was another guy who's better looking than you, stronger than you, and he goes to your wife. Is it good for you? <laughs> well, I mean, he's better than you. Why aren't you happy? <laughs> okay, so then, so then how do we get to systems that take all of that into account? Do you I think don't think you can. I think the whole point is you cannot control super intelligent systems if you're not at that level yourself. So we're just kind of... It sounds like you're kind of pessimistic about the future, that, that there's not really a, a particularly positive branch of the Everett universe in front of us. Well, I think I'm realistic. It's neither negative or positive. I think it's just the reality. No one has so far proposed anything which is uh, likely to scale. There is no working prototypes. Pretty much every paper on AI safety is just us discovering additional problems in this fractal <laughs> manner where, oh, we have this tiny solution, but it comes with 10 additional problems. Well, that I, I guess if I were trying to play the optimist, I would just hope that that's because the field's very new and that everything is new and that all there are is this endless vista of problems in front of us, but that hopefully with time we would, we would come to find common themes among the problems, common solutions to different problem classes. Uh, do, so do you usually you can look... Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, do you think there's any hope for that? Usually you can look at a case where, what if I had infinite compute? Can I solve this problem? Right. And with traditional AI, it works beautifully. With infinite compute, I can solve all sorts of things. I don't see how infinite compute gets me more in terms of safety. It helps a lot in terms of capability, but in terms of safety, I'm still in the same position. So that's not a good sign. No, no, it's definitely not a good sign. But I also think part of that is because we don't have a very clear definition of what safety even entails. I mean, people have only been thinking about this for 10 or 15 years, arguably. And so it, it takes rather a lot of time to discover what we mean when we describe an agent as safe and how we prove that, how we establish that. Like, what are the standards of proof? I mean, as you said, if you make one mistake in a billion and you make 10 billion decisions a second, well, I mean, that's, that's rather a lot of mistakes. And as the stakes get higher, the downside is grows proportionately. And so I would hope that as people like yourself and Elias Yudkowsky and the various other AI safety acolytes move the field forward, we would discover signs of hope, for lack of a better term. I hope you're right. Uh, I think before AI safety started as a field, there was a lot of similar work in economics and philosophy, ideal advisor theories and uh, similar research. At exactly the situation, if you have this uh, much smarter advisor, how should you interact? Should you take the advice? And uh, I don't think there are solutions. There are kind of proposals. If you are willing to sacrifice who you are today, so sacrifice your identity and go, I'm happy to be whatever that thing converts me into, then that's a solution. But I don't think you can preserve your current state, current state of all of us, and at the same time, follow advice of something much smarter. I'm, I'm sure that's true. Yeah. So could you say a little bit about the uh, ideal advisor work and, and what that's like? I've, I've never really encountered that literature, but I don't think what you just said is particularly controversial. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to preserve this version of yourself, but if I grow into something better. Right. And, so and you, let's say it. you have a super intelligent machine and it's capable of modifying your DNA to where it makes you smarter, makes you have more memory, make better decisions. Better looking. And you are cool with that then whatever that thing makes you into, it works. you fine. You can be at that level as well, whatever it's uploads or some sort of hybrid approach. But I think you stop being you. 
you definitely no longer exist as you are today. I, I'd be fine so, with that. But, and it's fine, but not everyone is. So if you could press a button and you are destroyed and something much smarter created, which is claimed to historically be connected to you, is this sufficient for you to say, let's move forward? If the answer is yes for, for all of us, then let's do it. Right, yeah, and, and, and your worry is that for quite a lot of people, that will not be the case. And what will happen to them? And also maybe for you, if you actually think about it a little longer, you realize that doesn't do anything for you at all. You are literally just replaced by something else. <laughs> maybe something else is better, but it does nothing for you. But it does nothing for me. Um, so what's, what's the time frame where we get into danger? I mean, is it six months, six years? That's a great question. Uh, I used to go with uh, Kurzweil 2045, sounded like a really good answer. More and more, I get uh, people saying three to seven years, maybe non-zero probability of creating AGI. I don't have any insider info, but uh, I would give it non-zero chance in five years and very good uh, probability at 2045. So that's just an, a generic artificial general intelligence, not necessarily one that we need to fear a lot from. But whether or not you believe that will depend on whether you're a fast takeoff or a slow takeoff kind of person. So where do you come down on that debate? I think the moment you get to human level, you almost immediately get super intelligence just because you don't even have to invent anything else. You just take a human, which is directly connected to all the cyber resources, internet, fast compute, perfect memory, that alone creates a super intelligence. Well, that, that would be a, a, a relatively, I guess, weak super intelligence. Uh, what, what about smarter the, than any one of us. Sure, sure, but not by like a huge margin. And also, it's, it's not necessarily making fundamental changes to the underlying algorithms that generate intelligent behavior. So for some time horizon, if, if that is the source of its speed ups and its super intelligence, we might reasonably expect that it will take a while for it to just be completely out of control. It, right now, it's just like your smarter friend who you, you can't model his behavior, but he's not totally leaving you in the dust or she. But if the if the algorithm is able to fundamentally change its underlying code, at some point, it's just it hits a singularity. Right. We just have absolutely no idea what it's going to do after that. So I, I guess I'm still curious about the fast and, and hard takeoff because those are those are different. Yeah, I think you are completely right. But more and more, we see that simply adding more compute does give us pretty much exponential improvement. So I think if you get a human, smartest human on the planet to run a million times faster, that alone should be sufficiently dangerous. That alone should be sufficiently dangerous. Yeah. I've, and I've, then it can still work for a week to improve algorithms. But I think it's beyond the point. Whatever it has a Q of 10,000 or 50,000, I don't think it makes, makes a difference to us. Yeah, to, to the relative chimpanzees that are still stuck on the ground. Exactly. Do you think there will be any diminishing returns in the recursive self-improvement? I don't think we know very much about the space of recursively self-improving algorithms and, and how that might play out. So are you at all worried that there will be, well, I guess worried is not the right term. Are you at all hopeful that there will be diminishing returns and it will not be able to escape so quickly? It is quite possible that it will hit those returns, but I think all of it happens so high above human level that it wouldn't look any different to us. As I said, 10,000 to 50,000 IQ points. doesn't matter. Okay. So at that point, it's just sort of escaped and, and that's it. It's superior, completely dominating our efforts. Do you think that that ability will be evenly distributed across all its applications. So it's, it seems like playing Go really well is, is rather a different thing than making good conversation or, you know, seducing our wives or, or whatever, you know, D do you think that an IQ of 10,000 will be equally valuable across all of those, those domains? Well, any domain where intelligence seems to offer some sort of advantage. Yes. If it's something more emotion based, maybe it's not as uh, obvious. The dominance can be relative like art, I mean, people produce terrible modern art and still qualify as <laughs> artists. So I guess it's not the same. Yeah. Well, by the, st by the horrible standards of modern art. Um, l let's talk a little bit about the hardware and the systems that you think will generate super intelligences. So three to seven years sounds awfully optimistic to me. I'm a, I'm a machine learning engineer. So I, all day I'm, I'm trying to get my algorithms to identify, you know, cats or dogs, you know, and, and they're usually not very good at it. It takes a lot of tuning and stuff. So as someone who's actually trying to build these predictive applications, seven years just sounds ridiculous. Uh, what, what is the work on that like? And what do you think are the systems that will eventually lead us 
in that direction? Like, will it require an entirely new architecture or do you think enough deep learning, like uh, enough parameters and enough neural network layers will get us there? More and more, I think that just having a big enough model with enough compute, with enough data gives you human level performance. I mean, we're, we're neural networks after all. I mean, that's how we got human level performance in the first place. Absolutely. Right? That's exactly. And we are very slow neural networks. We are limited. Uh, this is much more abstract, much faster at the level of individual neurons. You can combine multiple uh, pre-existing approaches. So I think it's not a guarantee. We might have to have additional breakthroughs, but I, I, I think so far what we see with language models and now more with image models, they are not uh, hitting any plateaus. They keep improving with more with more, more computer, computer. More and more data. So I, I do worry because the, the underlying networks, the, basic constituent components of the networks are relatively impoverished compared to actual neurons. I mean, this is based on work done in the 50s and 60s, the artificial neural networks that came out of uh, Mikulov and Pitt's lab. And so I wonder if there's not computations happening in the brain that are kind of hidden from a neural network such that they won't, or it, not that they won't be able to capture all the relevant behavior, but that it will take a lot more time th than we're that we're currently estimating because the, 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 the neurons in a neural network are not the same as the neurons in a brain. And there's rather a lot happening. We're discovering new things about how oligodendrocytes contribute to computations happening and, and how the connections work. And uh, I, I wonder if that might put a speed limit on the development of current deep learning technologies and the likelihood that that will lead to full blown human level intelligence. It's possible. And some people argue that there may be quantum effects in the brain, something we haven't detected yet. It's all possible, but we are hitting human level and above on many domains, which 10 years ago, we couldn't even do 10% accuracy. So something is working. I understand it's not the same neuron in a brain and artificial model for it, but it seems to be producing very similar results and even uh, side effects, uh, things like optical illusions, Things like mistakes being made, they are identical to the way humans make those mistakes or experience illusions. So there seems to be enough similarity to get us there. Interesting. Yeah. Could, could you talk a little bit about the optical illusions and the mistakes that it's making? Right. So optical illusions, you look at something and it's designed to trick your visual system. You start seeing things rotating, colors changing, size mistakes. Uh, neural networks designed for normal image recognition processing, not designed to experience visual illusions, also happen to experience those optical illusions in the same way. Oh, so they make same mistakes about comparative size. They say, yeah, something is moving there. And uh, in one of my papers, I tried arguing that they kind of experience this illusion. You have to experience it to get it. You can't just say, okay, I see pixel, this color spectrum at this location. So this makes me think that maybe there is even a trivial uh, consciousness, some sort of rudimentary consciousness starting to show up in those systems uh, as a side effect of computation. And as they get more capable in computation, maybe that also will scale uh, along with uh, capability. Interesting. So, so you, you think in deep mind there might be a glimmer of consciousness? Uh, again, primitive. If you think bacteria are conscious in a certain way, if you think uh, small animals have certain levels, it's uh, it's a spectrum. It's not a binary right. yes or no. So they are starting to show some sort of uh, local perceptions based on their hardware, software set up in previous experiences. Uh, let me let me ask this question um, from a little bit different perspective. Um, uh, years ago, I had an aquarium and uh, I stocked it with uh, lots lots of fish. And there's this one kind of a fish called the cichlid, which uh, decided it wanted to kill all the other fish until it was the only fish left in the aquarium. And then it uh, and then it was sitting there, and and I kept uh, I kept asking myself why would why would it do that? Because then there's nothing left. So with with this progression of AI, there, it would seem that somewhere off in the distance, there's uh, a position of disillusionment where it realizes that it can't go any farther. Um, so then I ask the question, and then what? Um, because if it can see so far into the future, um, it would know that it 
there, there's limits to uh, everything. Um, is uh, is that realistic to assume that there's there's some endpoint? I'm not sure. I completely understand uh, your question. Well, if if uh, if AI takes over everything, um, is there is there an endpoint where it can't take over anything else? So uh, everything you mean, like our planet, there is still yeah. a whole universe out there. You can go explore. You can find our super intelligences to date. You can do all sorts of fun things. <laughs> Wonder what the super intelligent algorithm dating market is like. <laughs> do they Terrible. use Tinder? Yeah. yeah. You um, can't lie to an our super intelligence. It's horrible. Yeah. That's well. That's actually an interesting question. Is it like what what the game theory would look like among vastly smarter intelligences? Um, th that's actually a pretty good segue into my next question. You've introduced this term intellectology to delineate a new field of study aimed at understanding the forms and limits of intelligence and what those intelligences would find amusing, like the, the space of non-boring activity. So I, I have a couple of questions about this and I, I wanted to start by asking why we need this new word, this new concept. And people have been thinking about things like this for a while. So why is it that we need this new term? What, what work is that doing? So a lot of different fields study intelligence, but they approach it from different directions with different terminology, psychology, philosophy, computer science, uh, neuroscience, all of them have interest in it, but there is not a common vocabulary, common set of tools. It seems to make sense to have it combined, merged, and kind of help between fields, cross-pollination. Uh, so just for that reason, my research, if you look at my papers, they look kind of random and very diverse, but all of my research is either trying to understand how to create intelligence, detect intelligence, measure intelligence, control intelligence, it's all connected, but uh, from very different angles. And I think it's beneficial to make this uh, distinction. So you may be studying psychology, but you are contributing to this, to this area of understanding how brains work, how they create intelligence, uh, what are the limits to it. Uh, so I think for that reason, it's uh, not just a trivial uh, renaming, but actually a useful contribution. How does intellectology interface with those other fields, philosophy, psychology, neuroscience, and all the other ones that you named? Are you mining their papers for insights? Are you talking to them at their conferences? How are you pulled in concepts for those, from those fields? So this is new, and it's, uh, I'm trying to get people interested. I, I think uh, fields like artificial intelligence are subdomains in that field. So how do you create intelligence in silicon? How do you study models capable of producing intelligence? Uh, admittedly, I don't have millions of people who joined this uh, effort yet, uh, so I'm still hoping through my podcast interviews to entice more people to join. Well, we have a we have a vast reach, a billion downloads, so you know th th this is a great this is a great start. Um, <laughs> how do, how do you define intelligence? So one good definition is ability to achieve your goals in any environment. I think Shane Legg uh, surveyed about 50 different uh, definitions right. of intelligence and it's a merged version. So if I can beat you at chess, I can outperform you in the stock market, dating, doesn't matter. If I can always uh, win, capability of winning corresponds well to this notion of intelligence. So what do we do with people like Terence Tao, who's you know inarguably one of the greatest mathematicians alive and probably to have ever lived, but I... I don't know what his dating life is like, but I'm guessing uh, that I would have as good a chance as he would in the in the market. So is that just a matter of him focusing or, or do you suspect that he's so much smarter than me that if he really tried and we both hopped on Tinder, he'd actually do better? I suspect he'd outperform you <laughs> just because he's famous. Just name recognition alone will get him a lot more. I'm not than, so uh, sure he would be famous among the sorts of people that hang out on Tinder. Like I, I, I bet if you surveyed the Tinder population of, of who'd heard of Terrence Tao, it would be maybe it's a mistake of low intelligence to go on Tinder. Maybe you should hit uh, nerd conferences <laughs> for math where this type of fame would be an advantage. So I have, I have already lost it. He wouldn't even play the game on my terms. And that's, that's how badly he'd beat me is what you're saying. Sometimes picking a game to play is the most important decision you make. When you're selecting a poker table, you don't want to play with professionals. You want the grandma in Las Vegas. <laughs> okay, so 
I, I guess I want to push that lo- that definition of intelligence a little bit and talk about what that would look like mathematically, because there are other ongoing efforts to define intelligence mathematically. And presumably, if we're going to build a super intelligence, it's going to have to be some sort of function or uh, s- some measure or cost measure utility function that it's trying to maximize or minimize. Right. So what does that look like when you actually sit down and, and draw it out in symbols? So there is different models which you will rely on compression, your ability to compress knowledge and predict future states. Okay. Or you can, um, I mean, this is less popular, but I argued that simply brute force is a superior algorithm. Uh, Problems we face in everyday life uh, actually not that uh, large in scale. So mathematically, we, of course, have tremendously large challenge puzzles. But in every day, you're deciding, do I go to Oxford or Harvard? Do I go with blonde or brunette? It's usually not that complex. So you can do a lot of interesting work with just brute force. Now, this is very controversial, obviously, but that's another model. So you can look at those things and see what type of compute you have available, what type of data. So I'm, I'm sort of interested in that because it's not clear to me that those simple decisions, which look introspectively simple, actually are that simple. I, I think a lot more goes into it, but much of it's kind of hidden from the decision-making process. So if you tried to model it out or game it out somehow, you'd quickly run into compute limits or limits in getting the data sets required to train an algorithm to do it correctly. Why, why do you think those are actually small scale? It's not obvious to me that they are. But when I say small, I mean relatively small. So you still wouldn't be able to brute force it as a human with a pen and paper, but uh, I think for a machine with uh, large computational resources, it may be possible to look at a billion different paths. It's still a huge number, and uh, I'm just saying that it would be a superior approach to the way we make decisions. Okay. So, um, reading between the lines of what you're saying, um, in, in our current political climate, it would seem like uh, once we get to a certain point, people that are pro AI suddenly their lives will start to improve, and the people that are anti AI their lives will start to degrade. Uh, is that a realistic assumption? Uh, because things are happening in the background that we can't com- uh, comprehend at the moment. Well, I don't know if it, anyone is against AI. We all just want a safe, reliable, friendly AI. Nobody wants some malevolent AI. So I think we all agree. We just uh, disagree on, like with many other technologies, is it safe to deploy yet? Yeah, I, I think over time there's going to be diverging opinions. And so uh, I would think that the people that are um, really pro-AI, suddenly they're alive. They become billionaires and they become very wealthy and they control the world. The people that are against it suddenly... Um, yeah, they start losing income and they, they start getting relegated to the more impo- impoverished areas of the world. Well, we have examples of people who denounce technology, right? If you look at Amish, for example, they're not big on yeah. Internet, but uh, they have supposedly happy lives. So you have less power to control <laughs> global politics, but you may be still a happy human. Well, I, th- I think there are a couple of interesting questions that, that are involved there. I mean, first of all, I think there are a lot of people today that might be anti-AI if you, like, ask them, but they rely on it all the time without necessarily knowing. I mean, they, they don't think of Google Maps as AI. They don't think of Netflix recommendations as AI, but that's absolutely what's happening. I was explaining to my grandmother the other day that I was building a model to predict who will make purchases and why they've made purchases, and it just blew her mind. You know, and I was, I was like, well, this is just like the Netflix recommendation or the Amazon recommendation that you get all the time. Like, there's just some model underneath there that's trained on lots and lots of data that predicts that you will like this thing because other people similar to you like this thing. And so I think that there definitely will be militant anti AI factions that arise in the future. This is a pretty standard trope in science fiction, but that a lot of people won't even realize that this AI revolution has happened uh, or that they won't be following it very closely and know that that's going on. Absolutely. And we see it uh, today. I I go to a lot of conferences for top level executives, tell them about, you know, Bitcoin and AI, and uh, they are completely unaware of any of those technologies, and that's their field. They are making decisions about purchasing this technology, deploying it, and they are clueless even today. So, uh, absolutely, 
most people have no idea about concerns we have uh, knowing about this technology. Uh, it's interesting. At the same time, we're like, we don't have anything better than diapers and we're deciding what to do with superintelligence at the same time as civilization. So it's yeah. quite fascinating. Civilizations are interesting that way. Uh, people just make these day-to-day -day decisions, and, and you're absolutely right. Innovation moves dramatically quickly in one sector and not at all in another. Uh, we, we're using solutions that are 50 years old. Uh, but but in one sense, I think that's, that's somewhat a good thing. So I, I think that it, it will be good for the world when blockchain technology is everywhere and nobody even has any idea they're using it. I think that will actually be a sign that the technology has matured and that it, it's cashed out some of the promise that we all believe today that it has. Absolutely. And there is interesting proposals for integrating AI and blockchain technology for regulation for safety purposes. So. Well, we might as well get into that now since you, you, you brought up the blockchain. So blockchain and AI, how do you feel about it? What are the proposals? Let, let's just lump the buzzwords in it. We'll get to quantum computing in a little bit. So it allows you to keep track of what's happening. So if you want to log all that billion of decisions, that's one way of doing it. You can also keep track of what is real and what is fake. So fake artificially created pictures, videos, audio, virtual worlds can be authenticated. That's kind of useful. Um, but again, I don't think it's a solution to controlling super intelligent machines. You think eventually it'll escape? Uh, not, not a question of escape. It's a great uh, supercomputer. It's resources which would be used instead of doing useless work. It would be doing useful work for uh, making decisions. So what, what kind of jobs start to disappear as a result of this? And what new jobs come into play? Um, because it, uh, it gives us tools for creating lots of new industries. Um, have you given much thought to that? A little bit. So it, it seems like, uh, surprisingly, people who are plumbers will keep their jobs because that's kind of hard to do, hardware and unique configurations. People who are lower level cognitive laborers, accountants, tax attorneys, lawyers, uh, seem to be easily automatable. It's not obvious we were doing something useful in the first place, but now you can also <laughs> do it with a computer. Uh, we'll see a lot more people who are AI safety experts and telling companies, okay, don't deploy this product, it's going to embarrass you. So that's likely to grow. Um, yeah, we, we had Jared Bultima at Data Robot on episode six or seven, I think, and, and this came up as well, that... To the surprise of quite a lot of us, the jobs that are probably the safest from both outsourcing and automation are building your deck. Like the Chinese are not going to fly over here and build your deck. The Indians are not going to fly over here and build your deck. And probably no robots going to anytime soon. And so that's actually pretty safe. It's less clear that a programmer like myself is going to have a job in the long term. Like I, I may end up fixing toilets. Programming is the last job to go because the moment <laughs> yes. you can, no, no, I have a paper proving it. The moment you can write a program to do programming, you're done. But before that, you have this job writing programs. It's a kind of programming complete problem. But uh, everything else, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. On the other hand, if you look at uh, robots from Boston Dynamics, they're dancing, they're fighting, they're doing parkour why not plumbing maybe that's the next step if there is enough money in that and i think plumbers make like a hundred bucks an hour or more so that's true the boston dynamics has really pushed the the frontiers of of robotics technology I, i'm curious as to how long you think programmers have i mean i have a direct interest in this question how long do we have before so that's exactly the date when agi comes right you have human level intelligence that's a programmer so as i said 2045 i'm very confident in Three to seven years, maybe 10%. 23 years. Is that enough time for me to, to save up and weather the singularity? What happens to money after the singularity? That's the question for you guys. Uh, I don't know if I should blow my investments or invest more. That's true. Well, it's know. different if you're pro-AI after that or if you're anti-AI. Well, and if, if, we, if we advanced the AI agenda, will it look back on us favorably and, and keep us as pets or, or are we sort of doomed? <laughs> Do pets need 401k? That's the question. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what ex uh, effect does quantum computing have on the AI world? Will it have a huge effect, a minor effect, um, or none at all? 
So it seems like we can do a lot of things without quantum computers and we're scaling just fine. Uh, I think it's more likely to have substantial impact on uh, cryptography, a uh, world of privacy, secrecy, because a lot of algorithms currently deployed would be broken as a result of uh, successful deployment of quantum computers. But it's also possible that it's very useful for training machine learning algorithms. Well, it's turned out that natural language processing was an unlikely domain in which quantum computers really sped things up. Um, so, yeah, it, it could very well be the case that certain sub-applications of machine learning or artificial intelligence are profitably farmed out to quantum computers. And it's not clear which ones it will be in advance. So that's that's very interesting development. It's possible. I, I don't have any strong opinions either way. It could be, could be beneficial, could be more challenging if it happens even sooner as a result. So you mentioned earlier that you think these neural networks have glimmers of consciousness. So how do you define consciousness and, and how would you test for such a thing? How would you know that it has it? Right. So the word consciousness has many sub definitions within it, sub tasks. Uh, all of them are doable and standard von Neumann architectures. The interesting one is the heart problem. Why do you have certain qualia? Why do you have certain internal experiences? And uh, I think it's just a side effect of computing. You cannot compute things without having experiences of that data, which are kind of like errors of your hardware and software combined, side effects of your processing. So when I see an optical illusion, it's a mistake of my optical system, my brain combined. Uh, if you think of someone being colorblind, for example, they experience world in different colors. It's a mistake they're making. We're starting to see it with computers, depending on what type of camera they use, depending on the algorithms they use. They look at a picture of noise and go, oh, it's definitely a panda. Like, I'm 100% confident that it's a panda. So they experience that image in that way. So are you now, saying... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, you were curious, how can we test for it? So yeah. I don't think it's possible to experience what it's like to be you, what it's like to be a bat, but I can test whatever you have experiences. If I show you an infinite sequence of optical illusions, novel optical illusions, and you correctly guess for each one what I experience on it, I have no choice but to conclude you have an accurate model of a human which is conscious or you yourself have those experiences. If you cannot Google the answer, if you cannot guess it, it's a long sequence of multiple choice questions, I have to conclude that you had to experience those optical illusions. Couldn't it just be an artifact of the large scale or mesoscale features that the neural network is focusing on. So I'm thinking of like a convolutional neural network and how when you pass the filters over the pixel grids, certain things jump out to it, whether it's the horizontal lines or the vertical lines. Couldn't it just be that this is an error produced by it focusing on certain aggregate features and not necessarily that it's having an experience like a human? Right. I'm not saying it would have it like a human. I'm saying it would have something I would call an experience. If a machine can look at an illusion and go, whoa, it's rotating. I can't really deny it this experience. I'm not saying it's like mine. I'm not saying it's like a cat, but it has some sort of experiences. They could be completely alien to us. But to say it had no experience, I think, would be a mistake. Again, somewhat uh, controversial. That's very interesting. I, I'd never heard that answer to the question of determining whether or not something has an experience. Well, why, why do you think that would mean the lights are on in the neural network? However dimly, well, why do you think that would mean that, that it's got some kind of internal experience as opposed to just it's measuring the changes in the pixels and it knows that that corresponds to rotating because that's how all the data are labeled? But I see it knows it corresponds to something presupposes that I already have this database of all possible illusions and I just kind of apply the same approach. If you can design novel illusions, you've never seen one like that before, and you accurately predict how I would experience it, maybe you have a perfect model of me. That, that's fine. But then your model itself includes everything I'm capable of, including consciousness. Interesting. I'd have to think about that. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that follows. I'll send the link to the paper. You can see if it's yeah, worth reading. It's compelling. Well, I'm sure I'm sure it's worth reading. Um, I, yeah. I just, I'd have to get, have let, to give let, that some thought. Let me ask this from a little different angle. Um, it's it's the idea of how can flawed humans 
create unflawed AI. Um, I mean, everything that we do, we have quir quirky errors uh, somewhere embedded in everything that we do. Um, so inside of AI is, is uh, undoubtedly lots of quirky errors that have been created along the way. Um, won't these become massive failure points sometime in the future? Already. I mean, that's the whole area of bias in AI, right? You train on data generated by humans over hundreds of years, and it's full of prejudices and uh, mistakes. And uh, that's why we have so much hope for zero-knowledge systems, which ignore previous cases and rediscover everything from scratch. But they may discover their own mistakes. So, so when, it, when AI is going on this growth curve, uh, approaching escape velocity so to speak, um, uh, there's, there's things that'll be built into it, friction points that will, um, I don't know, I guess, I guess I'll have to think about this more, but it seems like invariably something will fall apart along the way. I'm not disagreeing with you. Okay. Well, yeah, so that's one key leitmotif that keeps coming up in the debate about AI safety is be people will say, well, just have the AI ask you if you approve the changes or, or just have it in constant conversation with AGI experts or something like that. And, and the retort usually from Yudkowsky or whoever is, is that, but that is not itself a guarantee of safety. Like that code can also have mistakes in it. It can also have loopholes that allows the, the AI to develop along a dangerous trajectory. And it sounds like you sort of come down in the middle and say, yeah, try everything, but it's probably not going to work. Try everything, but this approach of asking programmers, first of all, it forces the system to manipulate the programmer, either through blackmail or bribery or psychological tricks. Second of all, uh, you may think something is desirable. Right now, you would want it. But if you actually tried it, you would hate it. Every year, you know how many undergrads change majors? <laughs> I thought I'm going to love programming. Turns out it's not playing video games. I hate programming. <laughs> Get me out of here. It's the same for almost everything. Half the marriages end in divorce. None of these people thought that marrying this person was terrible. Yeah. We are not good at predicting future and future of our happiness. So simply the system asking, do you want me to change everything to gold? Uh, okay, sounds good. Yeah, do it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> well, it also ignores the fact that there'll be a profound economic incentive to remove those bottlenecks because presumably there will be a huge first mover advantage for anyone who develops an AGI and puts it in control of their weapon systems or something like that. Right. So there is advantage to being first. And so a lot of safety will be bypassed again. I'm not quite clear on what happens to money, whatever dollars of Bitcoin after you have free labor, cognitive and physical. Is yeah. it still useful if I can get everything for free? Yeah, me either. That's something I return to periodically, what I think the world will look like afterwards. And I haven't sorted it out yet. I'm, I'm kind of studying economics relatively intensively because I, I want to bring a non-trivial perspective to that. There, there's just so much bullshit out there, people speculating on it. I want to do a better job of it. But in the in the time we have left, I actually, I, I've wanted to interview you for years. The reason I actually did pull the trigger this time is because you, you were a co-author on a paper about the long-term prospects of human civilization. And we've kind of been circling that, this whole conversation. So I thought we would wrap up by addressing this directly. What do you think the prospects are? Is it good? Is it bad? What do we need to move it from the, the second to the first? Um, what steps should we be taking now to try to ensure our long-term survival? Just riff on that for a little bit. So I am trying to solve those problems. I think they are difficult, maybe unsolvable, but I'm still trying. And uh, one of the solutions to at least this multi-agent value alignment problem I see is uh, creating virtual worlds which are individual. So if I can get to the point where my virtual worlds are as good as what you see, so it's a simulation hypothesis, we can make it, you, you would not know the difference. I can literally create 8 billion individual virtual worlds. And in your world, whatever you think is best can happen. You can be king, you can be slave, you can be whatever you want. You can interact with others if you choose. You can have no other conscious beings to worry about if you choose not to. Now, that reduces the problem to how do we control substrate, right? The thing it's all running on, the servers. If you can get that safe, then we don't have to agree on anything. You want a world where you're doing whatever you're interested in, 
okay, that's your world. You want to escape from that, go somewhere else. You can hop through different worlds, experience them. You can take the best properties of different worlds. Basically, you are limited by whatever your brain in combination with super intelligence would sustain. That's very interesting. So it's sort of like a, a super version of the patchwork solution to interpersonal conflict where you just remove it by letting people self sort and then you leave each other alone. So there's just little right. communities with their laws and these other communities with their laws. And as long as you keep the kind of commons safe, the, the thing that runs everything, that doesn't particularly matter. Yeah. So the smallest minority is an individual. You can have the society you want and uh, be happy with this multiverse. That's really interesting. I'd never considered extrapolating it all the way out. Do you have any thoughts on, on keeping the underlying substrate safe? The blockchain, no. obviously? No. That's the control problem. How do you get super intelligent machine to do what you want? And uh, it doesn't look good yet, but I have three years to do it. So. <laughs> uh, three. <laughs> <laughs> well, very nice. Um, do we have any concluding questions? Uh, no. This this, uh, this has been very enlightening. I think uh, um, part of what you're uh, there's there's an eventuality piece to all this that this is going to happen whether we want it to or not um and that can be both alarming and um uh, maybe a cause for celebration for some people yeah um but i i'm i'm not sure that uh we, we really have a clear picture in the future so one of the things i talk about as a futurist is this idea that we're walking through a dark forest at night with a flashlight and every step forward we, we can see a little bit farther. And so as a futurist, my job is to give people a slightly brighter flashlight. Uh, so that I, I thank you for coming on our podcast here. Uh, this has been very enlightening, at least a little bit farther. Yeah, appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you so much for inviting me. You kind of pushed me to think deeper about some of those directions and question my assumptions. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to hear that. We, we really try to do that. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate it. And you have a great day.